Ya. Nos ponemos a metro y medio. ¿eh? No, no, pero si tenemos mucho tiempo. ¿eh? Se ha quedado muy mal. Ah, que no te quieres quitar la mascarilla. No, pero si lo digo porque normalmente... Si quieres yo me, me voy a hacer. Si es que si, si, si ven una foto en un vídeo, pues normalmente tengo muchos problemas. Y pero no pasa nada. Ah, sí. Vale. Bueno, yo me lo quito ahora, ¿vale? Sí, sí. Bueno, eh, yo creo que enlaza muy bien esta mesa con la intervención anterior. Creo que además... Uh, round table can tie off nicely with uh, the previous one. The measures that are currently being adopted in the cities that my colleagues here represent fit perfectly with uh, everything we've uh, just talked about. Maya Sánchez is a councilwoman for environmental issues for the Valladolid uh, municipality, where uh, for years now they've been working towards restricting car access and improving Uh, quality of life in the town uh, center. Uh, my colleague will also be uh, sharing with us uh, his experience in terms of traffic reduction. We also have Annabel Guias from Pontevedra. Uh, and uh, she'll be telling us about uh, their experience in Pontevedra, where they've been very, very brave, I have to say, in the past few years. People often talk about the Pontevedra model um, as one uh, to look up to, as it put uh, pedestrians at the center of it all. And then we have Cesar Gallardo from Seville. He'll be filling us in on two experiences. Um, one in the center of Seville with uh, an LEZ and then another one about the La Cartuja Island with its uh, pedestrian area. Let's kick it off. Thank you very much. Good morning everyone and thank you uh, for the invitation to take part in this uh, roundtable. It's been very interesting so far. Yesterday, there was an important uh, uh, event in, uh, in our cities and we saw celebrities talk to one another with their masks off and uh, it was quite strange to see that. It looked like a, a different reality, really. And I think it's a similar feeling to the one we get when we look at Plaza Mayor or Calle Santiago, completely free of cars. Those of you who are from Valladolid uh, know this for sure. There are a number of streets in our cities that would be difficult to picture um, differently to what they look like right now. Um, what is our vision for our cities? I think Right now, what we see in our cities are traffic jams, people struggling to adapt to change. And this is this happens when we think in on the short term. Thinking long term, on the other hand, uh, we know that it will be perhaps a little difficult to adapt, but we've done it before, and it's always yielded positive results. If we cast our a gaze further ahead in the future. We will enable an urban transformation, uh, perhaps not in 2021, 22 or 23, after 2030, but we will achieve it. 
I don't think we should be discussing whether it's good or bad for pedestrians or uh, motorists to um, pedestrianize areas within our cities. That's not the issue, I don't think. The real issue is that we are heavily reliant on private vehicles within our cities and they're bad for our health as well. Uh, we need to appeal to every person's individual sense of responsibility because with the traffic reductions come a number of positive aspects. We need to make it difficult to pollute our cities. If there are parking spaces available every other block, we won't be sending the right message. Those of you who are from Valladolid or those of you who have visited this city, know how important it is for buses, for example, public transport to circulate freely and uh, faster through our cities. You know how important it is to have safe uh, uh, pedestrian crossing around schools, for example. And we can achieve all of this who need uh, to drive on a daily basis. We can't forget that, but the vast majority of the population doesn't really. Um, and if we provide convenient alternatives to that, we will make it easier for people uh, to quit using uh, their private vehicles, their cars. And that's what we've been working towards at the Valladolid municipality back in 2015. When we took office, we immediately published pollution uh, statistics uh, online and on a free app. Because uh, in our opinion, the most important thing is to educate uh, our citizens. Debates can be misleading. I remember when uh, Central Madrid was in state and some people said, uh, where is pollution? I can't see it. And that clearly means that a better education is necessary. In 2017, Valladolid, we approved our anti-pollution program. Our figures showed that uh, on average 35,000 people would die in Spain every year due to pollution. And so thanks to state subsidies, these, and I'd like to thank the ministry for that. We activated our plan. It was a four year plan which led to 67 initiatives and um, on 14 occasions led to the total closure of traffic uh, due to the high levels of pollution within the city limits. During the pandemic, our readings were a little different, but the pandemic the pandemic was useful uh, as a sort of uh, urban laboratory, a sort of workshop that we could use to experiment with alternative solutions, precisely because uh, we, well, people weren't allowed to leave their homes. They didn't need to uh, drive anywhere. And uh, readings were very, very different. We do know that without traffic, our health improves. So I'll exact on that. In August 2019, we activated our plan yet one more time with great results. Our air quality, of course, is still not optimal, but there has been a decrease in death thanks to that. Anytime we've needed to impose a traffic closure within the town center, we called meetings with business associations to explain to them why we were doing that. And it was 
difficult, let me tell you, because uh, there was a lot of work to be done. Our technicians, our experts need to explain what our graphs were all about. And often people didn't seem to believe our statistics, but we achieved it in the end. And now our readings are much better compared to 2015. So this emergency plan was useful, but it wasn't enough. And that's because it's a last resort. It's the last straw. Acting when the damage has already been done is necessary, but is not enough. We need preventative measures. when we have to close down traffic because of pollution, well, that clearly shows that we all need to take on different habits, pick up different habits as citizens. And how do we achieve that? We need a structural change, a change in our mobility habits, but our air quality plan also disseminates information about the importance of uh, um, renewable energy along with the government we have been working towards laying down a different plan a more extensive one because we need a cultural change that's inevitable in madrid we've seen for example how depending on who's in office these changes are implemented to different extents and this in turn leads to distrust from our citizens we do have the necessary regulation in these days we've been talking about the spanish law on the environment but there are also several uh, European laws that have been breaking ground in this regard. And this is great, but another thing we have to do is promote the use of public transport. Early Zs are great, but if at the same time we don't make it possible for people to use public transport, that's not enough in and of itself. And uh, we've already taken a few steps in Valladolid. Uh, bus tickets, for example, are free for people under 15. Um, this uh, measure has been questioned repeatedly but at the same time it has a number of positive effects because children get used to using public transport also we are overhauling current regulation we want to create more shared public spaces the speed limit 30 kilometers an hour within the town center has been reinforced we have um, reinforced our bus public transport um, lane network across the city and we're very proud of all of that it's important we think to promote a global vision of these uh, policies and we're doing that our municipal fleet, for example, when fleets are old, it's difficult to promote the use of uh, public transport. And as a result, we've been doing our best to electrify it, uh, to go fully electric uh, within our public transport system. Next slide, please. This plan is an action guide and it comprises um, a specific segment on health, for example, on ozone. Ozone is a secondary component, but we do know that it has a huge effect on our citizens health and we need more restrictive um, measures on top of that we have a program of diagnostics um, 
set up by the University of Valladolid, along with a number of measures that aim to improve air quality with the overall goal of complying with the goals set by the WHO, which have become more demanding as of one week ago. So this is a new challenge that cities have. We can't turn a blind eye to that. Um, so public administrations are responsible for conducting a technical overall overhaul of their uh, um, individual situations. This is uh, what we need to do. It's a reality. Uh, figures from the WHO and new limits that have been approved are different, difficult to to comply with, not only for Valladolid, but also for Madrid and Barcelona, which are much, much larger. So what kind of measures do we have? Mobility, education, training, participation, residential and industrial use um, we've also been uh, coordinating with the castilla leon autonomous community with a view to reducing emission across the whole region of valladolid and beyond our goals as you know are air quality educating minimizing impacts on pollution etc etc these are the measures and as you know this is also about lezs um, which are regulated by the spanish law on climate change and as uh, my colleagues uh, said um, earlier a lot of work has been done in madrid barcelona seville and bilbao what's the advantage of lezs in my opinion one advantage they have is that they provide a uh, better more enjoyable open space for people and at the same time they act positively against pollution this has a positive impact on the health of citizens and visitors of valladolid we we'll encourage people uh, uh, to conduct activities, to carry out activities in the town uh, centre as well. Uh, electric cars, I would like to say, surely they're great, but they're still uh, cars, and we have more statistics on that on the Ecologistas in Acción page, and the use should also be reduced when wherever possible. When uh, we did all of our projections, we decided uh, to introduce our LEZ in the very center of our town because it was an area, a part of town that we uh, were very familiar with and that we'd worked on with our emergency plan. We want to encourage participation from our citizens and so we also launched a number of uh, educational initiatives for the benefit of our um, population we collaborated with uh, several uh, trade unions and uh, associations and we're currently carrying out uh, a very extensive overhaul of um, the uh, situation so this is the shape of our soon to be implemented lez but we're still working on it regarding exemptions that's something we have uh, to look into we can't make the same mistakes that were made in madrid all exemptions need to be approved at a municipal level starting on january the 1st 2022 we'll be banning unlabeled vehicles to enter the town center this is our plan we can't really issue fines until uh, all the regulation has been uh, set up properly 
but we're working on that. Uh, a whole financial study needs uh, to be done. We're doing it, but it's not very easy. Uh, we need to uh, gather more data regarding how businesses will be effective, etc. But we do know that thanks to this project, we'll be complying with uh, the guidelines of the ministry. And we've actually asked the ministry to give us better uh, instructions, which I'm sure they will, regarding unlabeled vehicles, about 30% of total cars in Valladolid, 27,500 vehicles, altogether are unlabeled. So the first step will be taking taken in that direction, banning these vehicles from entering the town center. Later on, we'll be issuing fines as well. By January 2025, we initially wanted to ban traffic altogether from the town center. But it's currently being debated within public administrations. Uh, this is the scope of uh, our project. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you that uh, we've uh, presented this project. for financing, for European financing. So we may be receiving funds from the European Union. This is the right time to be ambitious. We have guidelines from the WHO, guidelines from the Spanish state, and in Valladolid, we're more than ready to comply with new regulations. As Carlos Bravo from Zaragoza said yesterday, uh, a few cities aren't ready. However, it's paramount that we make a collective effort to better protect the health of our citizens. And to that end, it's very important to comply with uh, these guidelines. The measures we've adopted so far have already had an impact on Valladolid. It's noticeable. We have uh, 25,000 more square meters of uh, worth of pedestrian areas, and that's absolutely great. People can now walk down Paseo Isabela Católica, and it's beautiful. Air quality has improved. It's at a record 97% now in the town center. And this shows that people know uh, what is required of them. Traffic has gone down by 30% in the town center as well. I think that when we talk in these uh, debates, the first thing that we have to do is to, as public administration, is, is to not take a step backwards and to be very firm in what we're doing and to be convincing and to ensure that the measures will, will really be inevitable. That means that even though there are changes in uh, the city government from uh, one political persuasion to another, the measures continue. I think uh, that's what we should be looking towards. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Well, now we now invite uh, Jaime Caballero, Mobility Councillor from Logroño Town Council, to come to speak to us. Can, I think people still can't hear me. Okay. I'll remain standing, therefore. Good morning, everyone. 
thank you to Ecologistas in Action for inviting me in and taking part in for inviting me to take part in this workshop, which is obviously essential, and we're looking at very Im important uh, questions. I want to uh, make some basic reflections, although uh, my colleagues have already touched upon most of them. There's a photo here of uh, LEZ. LEZ um, the traffic direct directorate um, gave this to us. Um, if, if you've been able to buy a relatively new uh, car, then you're able to come in to the zone. And if you haven't, then you haven't. Then you can't. If you're uh, a local resident in a, a pretty poor district, we, we wouldn't be able to uh, drive in to reach our own homes. And if we're somebody with reduced mobility we've got, and we've got an old car, we, wouldn't, we also wouldn't be able to. These are key issues. Everything depends on the, the town planning and the The governance of the uh, of, of the overall town and the different sets of laws and regulations which are established. We need to ensure that the right types of uh, regulations are taken on board in, to ensure that uh, we regulate the different types of access in the right way and we ensure that there is fairness and uh, that we are dealing with our most vulnerable groups in the best way possible. Isn't that things shouldn't just be based on whether or not people have got enough money to purchase new technology vehicles. I wanted to focus on this a little bit, local solution versus global solution. It would seem that uh, electric cars, uh, low LEZs, local solution. Air quality would be likely to improve a lot if we all have electric cars. But climate change is a global issue, it's not just a local issue. Jose Alfonso was touching upon certain of the key issues. Um, we need to look at a, an overall holistic solution and ensure that we are linked up with all the relevant stakeholders and all the relevant areas for action. Maria also mentioned the problems that, the really real problems that the, the pandemic introduced. Um, and also we can say that in Logroño the level of pollution went down we, when people stopped using vehicles due to the uh, lockdown measures. In terms of uh, restrictions vis-a-vis -vis the labelling or otherwise of cars, we can see a, a diagram here. If we have an LEZ in the centre of a city, um, that may be one thing. But if the city really is uh, quite spread out and has different uh, mini centres or, or neighbourhood centres, um, we must also take this on board. And we must look at the possibilities people have for moving around on foot or, or by bike in real terms. Here, the Logroño open streets. I can't go into too much detail, but uh, going above and beyond this idea of the, uh, the, the super blocks, that would mean looking at uh, three blocks by three of a, of a, of a um, city centre in which you create modal filters and uh, you make traffic guidelines in such a way that you uh, ensure that there's a restriction but also mobility of the right type for local residents. 
and you have the logistics and uh, waste waste collection measures correctly applied that you're not just focusing on whether there's labeling of cars and whether one type or another type of car is allowed to come in but the whole welter of issues if we go above and beyond uh, this and look at other strategic uh, proposals the the so-called uh, pacified areas here on our map which are the yellow beige colored areas and the the advances that have taken place really since uh, people began considering things uh, in around 2013 you can see that uh, there's quite a large area of the city which even we could say most of it which is now LEZ we have uh, a healthy cycling route there we can see in uh, the reddish color just to give an example and you can see this in in Google Maps All the uh, beige color areas are the um, pedestrianized areas and this street, which I'm putting to now, where you can see there's a, a modal filter. They have to, the cars have to turn back to the right. They can't cross over from south to north within this neighborhood. Um, there, there's a one-way system in there, which, and we take into account uh, everything in terms of the public buildings that may be their schools or, or the public libraries we can see on this uh, photograph and you can see the uh, direction the cars which can come in have to use they, they can't just go from north to south here you can see photos um, looking at this type of street with um, different types of parking spaces Here we get certain streets which are um, where there is no access and uh, we the one-way systems that are in place and the spaces we've generated like this which are um, for walking for for bikes as you can see there with pictures of uh, kids um, cycling quite safely or people at cafe terraces chatting or having a meeting or listening to music this is what I was mentioning a bit earlier and you can see here there's a school um, the Madre de Dios school um, so we really made that the center of what I was talking about earlier in terms of developing the um, the very specific pedestrianized and one-way system here we can see the photos before and after and uh, the uh, the impact on the um, the crossings of the streets which become a lot more um, uh, narrow and you can see how we address the problem of uh, accidents and people being knocked over by introducing these positive measures to restrict traffic so the small number of cars which can come in have to be aware that they're coming into a, a different uh, type of, of zone uh, and uh, this is why we've got the right type of signing up and uh, people are indeed fully aware this is another of our so-called pacified areas uh, with another school in the center of it this this uh, street which was in fact running between the um, the infant school and the uh, junior and start of high school of uh, an overall large school you can see the, um, the pictures there uh, this is how we've uh, allowed ourselves to be led in terms of uh, the developments we've done we've looked at where there's there have been large schools in, in the center of urban areas and we've tried to develop projects with the school firmly at the center and we've taken on board all the stakeholders from the schools as well as of course the pupils themselves
making the uh, crossings uh, more narrower. Uh, we've risen the um, in height the actual crossings, uh, taken very firm measures to act as barriers and to show any of the cars, the low number of cars which can come in, um, uh, and the, uh, the way they have to behave. And we've gotten rid of the problem of uh, cars being double parked, for example, in front of schools in a, in a pedestrianized area. And this, this used to happen. We've got the school with these, these uh, intersections. And since we, we have a, a rise there, um, a bump in the road, which has been put in, the cars absolutely have to slow down. There's, there's no, no way for that to be ignored. So um, here there's another idea of this super, super block concept. Um, and here we've got uh, the entry to a zone like this, where we've got the uh, the photo here of cars being uh, badly parked on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is the after photo. Again, here, left and right, before and after. And uh, again, there was uh, work undertaken to ensure that obstacles were placed in the roads around these uh, areas to ensure that cars had to uh, slow down the number of cars which were able to come in. This street here was a link between the primary school and the high school that we can see at the end of the road there. You can see the, the, the difference there between the left and the right hand side photos. When you can see the LEZs um, outlined here, and we have our mobility strategy, that, has meant, that means a, a big change. But we want the whole of the city to be affected. Um, we want to look at things in a holistic uh, Way, and we want to ensure this superblock concept is uh, applied correctly throughout our city. In the European Mobility Week, we looked at things very um, specifically. If you look at red there, these are the things which channel uh, all the traffic from uh, right, from uh, south to north or east to west, indeed. You can see the LEZ of the historic centre and the pedestrianized area where we've got uh, our so-called 100 shops uh, area. So we're pr applying this, um, the same logic as we did in these, uh, our so-called pacified um, areas, uh, looking towards and, and using indeed uh, the uh, the outer ring roads of the city in order to, uh, in, for the purpose of uh, going around the city as opposed to going right through the historic center. Jose Alfonso touched upon a number of these questions earlier. Perhaps uh, the filters, etc., were not enough, but um, so we, we've introduced camera. Um, surveillance here as well in some of our central streets to ensure that there's compliance with the, uh, the measures in in place and we can there, thereby monitor what's going on at different times during the day and night. <coughs> Model 3 here, we want to uh, avoid this uh, model in which there are tunnels going through the center of the city. Two years ago, you know, you know, when we arrived at the council, um, this was this, this work was was already um, being built, and there was going to be another one built. But we decided to stop the one the one that was being built and to transform this tunnel here 
in a crossroads and therefore we won over 4,000 meters of uh, public, public space for our citizens. And this, this is the type of measure which means that the city can reduce its uh, level of pollution. If we had maintained this tunnel, then it would have been a lot more difficult to achieve reductions in pollution. In look, looking at uh, reducing congestion as well, there are other measures. We created a cycle pathway going through the city and we looked at redistribution of public space using sustainable transport, as I said, um, bikes, for example. And we managed to reduce that for um, parking double parking um, and stopping this idea that cars necessarily have to take you door to door and meaning that we uh, get the message across that people have to reduce speed and that uh, speed is not king. You can see uh, certain of our central streets here uh, on the right hand side the change that's been achieved. There's been a, a redistribution and you can see there's a shared um, lane for different modes of transport and then there's a, as a an exclusive uh, bike lane and provisional um, widening of pavements and uh, ensuring that we're able to generate the right type of changes to achieve the changes that are required for the climate change measures. You can see the, um, this, the, the, the image here prior to what was done and look at the change at the bottom and um, again this raised uh, part of the road that was created in order to reduce speed and the bumpers that were put in place there as well and the measures taken to improve um, the routes available to cyclists all of which um, improved everything around the school and its whole environment and also a shared um, lane so that we could encourage car users and bike users to coexist. This is another picture of the same street, more double parked cars and a reduction in public space. But now there's a parking lot. Double parking is not allowed unless perhaps some lorries have to unload um, parcels. Then buses. There are two lanes down uh, this road, w w which is one of the main ones in the city. And this was a swift tactical approach to make uh, the city safer, pedestrian crossings safer as well. We have created a sort of zigzag route so as to ensure that cars comply with uh, the existing speed limits. And that's something we've been doing throughout the whole city, really. There are more pedestrian crossings now. We've created 50 new ones, actually. And by doing that, we have prioritized uh, pedestrians. This in turn leads to um, a speed reduction. Cars now know that they're no longer the owners of our streets. We've also created um, an improved access to schools and uh, office buildings. In this particular case, you can see a school before and after we intervened. We um, created uh, a bike park just by the school door to give a better visibility. And uh, the platform has really been yielding great results because cars truly drive slowly in the vicinity of our schools. 
this is also before and after comparison, we added a further pedestrian crossing and we created a pedestrian um, uh, platform for students to benefit from. So whenever you do a campaign like this one, by analyzing school routes, the result is that you truly make mobility in and around schools a lot more sustainable. This, this is yet a, another example of uh, uh, what of what we uh, we did we pedestrianized this uh, little alleyway this uh, little alleyway used to be uh, very much uh, uh, dominated by uh, by vehicles a lot of traffic jams uh, we pedestrianized it and um, now it's all a lot better for uh, locals living there, for the school that's in the vicinity. We've truly converted this area into something that uh, citizens can truly benefit from. I think I've gone a little over time, but if you have any more questions about Pontevedra, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Yes, it certainly seems like there are a number of very brave uh, um, administrations out there, and I'm very happy to see that. I'd like to give the floor to Annabel Gulias from Pontevedra. Pontevedra has been very brave in the past few years. They've uh, taken a few very important steps in the past few years. Pontevedra has become a true low emission zones. It's still um, ineligible to receive subsidies for low emission, low emitting cities because they don't emit at all. So over to you, Annabelle. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from Pontevedra. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'd like to thank our viewers, our participants, as well as the organizers. Unfortunately, the mayor was um, unable to join us today, uh, but um, he had an interview to record, uh, so couldn't be here uh, anyway. We're here today to talk about the process of change um, that uh, we have undergone in our city. I'll be giving an overview of our process at Pontevedra in the past few years. This is merely um, our humble interpretation of how things went down. I'll give you a breakdown of the main um, characteristics of our experience, uh, things that worked out in our city, I should point out. I believe you can see my presentation, so let's begin. This moment presents uh, a number of opportunities, as uh, other speakers have also said. Finally, we do have a nas nationwide agenda that's promoting debate. Uh, we often talk about liquid cities because uh, changes happen so uh, quickly. Um, we often spend too much time planning. Now, don't misunderstand me. Planning is absolutely necessary, but uh, I believe we spend a lot of time planning too much of it, perhaps, and little time acting. We shouldn't forget that regardless of size, small, large cities, these are the places we live in. 
and it's necessary to take proper care of the environment, to protect it, but also to reflect upon the air we breathe every day. So we should all reflect on the importance of clean air in our cities. And to that end, we need to make important decisions regarding our urban environment. From our point of view, this vision requires clear-cut goals and a clear-cut political agenda. One that is completely independent of uh, political parties. We need a shared vision in our policies. I'm very proud personally to be part of a political organization, but uh, in uh, politics, there are several different players that each promote different ways of thinking about uh, practical issues within our cities. But we need a shared vision. We need one sole unified project, one common idea of what we want to achieve. And once we have that, decisions need to be made. In this process, we had three uh, guiding lights, so to speak. The first one was the people who live in our cities. As you can see in our cities, as you can see in these pictures, our city was previously dominated by cars, and this was the space that we devoted to people. Second guiding light, how important is public space within a city? Public space to us is a right that's inherent to people who live in a city. A right that's just as important as all the others. So what do we want our public space to look like within our cities? This is something we should bear in mind when it comes to making decisions. And that's what we did in Pontevedra. People often talk about private vehicles and a lot of important issues, but it's also very important to talk about public space. And finally, who should be responsible for the urban restructuring of our cities? According to the Spanish legal uh, framework, one of the unquestionable principles is that it should be citizens. Citizens should have the prerogative to design their own cities. And we believe that political representatives that, that, that don't go by, that don't respect the will of their citizens, they're failing them. And that's what um, we kept in mind when it came to redesigning our city. And we redesigned our city, mind you, along with citizens' associations, with citizens themselves. This is a meeting we called back in 2016 where uh, we talked to people and showed them our project. Because to us, participation is fundamental. Now, Mind you, it's impossible to achieve full consensus at any given time. But the fact that we don't have full consensus doesn't mean that we can't make decisions. As a matter of fact, it can't be an obstacle. It shouldn't really. Often, we don't make decisions because in this lack of full consensus, we find the perfect pretext not to launch an initiative we really believe in. We are public representatives and every four years we are bound to listen to what our citizens have to say. But that doesn't mean we're exempt from 
having to make decisions, bold decisions sometimes. We went to this neighborhood in particular to talk to people because they were opposed to the measures we proposed. You need to act. In 1999, just to give you an idea, Pontevedra was a gray city, it was very unsafe, and it had very, very high volumes of traffic. Our population is uh, highly uh, dense, concentrated within the town center. And as a result, we had similar problems to larger cities. Again, we're a very compact. Um, yeah. When it comes to uh, low emission zones, When it comes to low emission to zones, different types of, uh, uh, several measures need to be adopted, hybrid, labeled cars, we'll car have, labeling, we'll still have traffic problems uh, but still, we'll as still long as there are cars in, in the town um, center, we will keep on having traffic uh, problems. Spaces, and, and, uh, we will still we be launching look at the, the whole of the message of issues. that pedestrians are less important than, For example, th than cars. Um, when we were looking at putting in an extra lane for, for cars, uh, and we had car lanes that were being overused, be because the message that people were receiving was that they, they needed to use their cars to go from one place to another. So the only way to reduce... Um, traffic uh, is 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 to get people to use cars less obviously not to send out the message that they need to be using them to go from a to b uh, there's no magic wand but we need to take the right decisions in political terms in terms of uh, uh, to really turn things on their head so that in a city like pontevedra that we really give more dignity to uh, walk in and to allow people to find ways uh, to move around which can be done um, without use of the car specifically by walking obviously and um, therefore we we want a people first approach regardless of um, people's uh, exact status and we need different uh, ways of mobility like cycling and then uh, Lastly, private vehicles as, as the last option. Obviously, um, walking can be a big, a big uh, solution for us in a city of our size, but uh, but we need to obviously uh, look closely at public transport issues as well. I was talking about um, this idea of getting rid of traffic altogether. You can see on the in 1999, we, the exact old center of the city, but um, there's a big change there when you look up to 2017, look at the road, no road network, where a lot of the old roads have, have gone for cars. Um, because what was happening in the past, as we could see, was that people were looking for shortcuts to get across. They, were, they weren't really looking to go into the center. They were just looking to go from north to south, for example. So there were improvements made there. And um, 
there are basically three types of traffic. But uh, we need to look at the different types, as, as I say. We need to generate different uh, systems in, in so that there are different loops. And uh, if people want to make it, to take a shortcut, they shouldn't be using their car. There's also traffic which is um, just uh, going around in circles looking for parking. And uh, I, for example, I live in a neighborhood of the city. And what I thought was that I could get my, take my car and uh, have a parking space close to where I was working. But of course, the the 64,000 people who live in the city were all thinking the same thing. So that you'd find that there were lots of people going around in circles trying to find a parking space. Um, so what, what we were trying to do it was to say to people that uh, you won't find a parking space, parking space because there, there aren't none, there aren't any, so don't use your car. And uh, when we were looking at uh, different issues involved in getting rid of traffic, people were saying, well, the city will collapse, but the city didn't collapse. Um, we can say that in Pontevedra, coaches, uh, cars can be used to go anywhere, but only the cars that need to come into the city centre actually do. So you need a reason to come into the centre of, of um, Pontevedra, whether it's for deliveries, whether it's uh, for collection of uh, a parcel, whether you are doing it for care reasons or picking up a family, an elderly family member. So you drop them off. And that's possible, but only when it's really necessary. We also found out that the cars are necessary to the functioning of a city are fewer than initially thought about parking. That's the big question. Our system is based on uh, three types of parking. Paid parking in underground uh, parking lots, then outdoors parking lots. Uh, the fee is actually quite low, about one euro per car. And the third option is outdoors parking in the town center right next to the town hall pretty much now we also have parking space five minutes from the town center at the edge of the city it's a little city it's not suburban parking so to speak and that's completely um completely free so if you remember i was telling you that uh, anyone can enter Pontevedra driving their cars, but no longer than 15 minutes. Nobody can park in Pontevedra for two hours in the town center, but they can park anywhere they want at the edge of it for as long as they want, and that's free. You can only be in the town center, however, for no longer than 15 minutes. Do you have something to do very, very quickly? You can do that. So right now in Pontevedra, you will see people as well as bicycles, as well as public transport, as well as privately owned vehicles. What do we need to do yet? Um, we need to mold our cities after our people. Accessibility need to be integrated into city design and when i talk about integration of course i'm making a reference to all sorts of uh, uh, people the visually impaired for example the those with 
hearing impairments as well. City needs to be a global concept. The concept of city needs to be global. And this is a clear right for all people. The representative from Logroño said, and I fully agree, that it's necessary when it comes to safe public spaces to discourage um, drivers from speeding. And we've achieved that by introducing over 700 speed bumps uh, throughout the city. They have two effects. On the one hand, these speed bumps physically prevent uh, motorists from speeding. And on the other hand, by introducing these speed bumps, we've created a scenario where um, people are the great protagonists of our cities. It's not uh, pedestrians that invade the dominion of cars. It's cars that need permission to access pedestrianized areas. We've also put a speed limit of 30 kilometers an hour at the edges of the city and 20 or 10 kilometers an hour within city limits. This goes hand in hand, of course, with the installation of once again over 700 speed bumps. I think it's important to talk about feminism in public spaces. Um, public spaces need to be safe. So when it comes to redesigning our cities, we need to remove all uh, visual uh, obstacles, hindrances. When women walk home, they need to be safe. Now, there would be um, a whole uh, uh, symbolic issue, if you will, to tackle um, here. Uh, a number of things should be uh, addressed. We could rename our streets after important women. For example, we could uh, redesign our mobility. as a function of uh, uh, the current reflection that has been made in gender issues, but th that's a much broader topic. Anyway, we also need a city that is modeled after children. If a city is apt for children, it's apt for anyone. Cities need to become a natural space where little children can feel free um, and that's not something to do in the future it's something we need to do right now so let's go back through a few important concepts step number one achieving a cultural change within our cities we have done that in pontevedra if you ask anyone in Pontevedra about the best way to get from A to B, they will tell you on foot. Two, we need to reclaim public space for pedestrians. We organize about a thousand cultural activities in public spaces every year, concerts, exhibitions, cultural activities, all sorts of activities that are promoted by either the town hall, the administration, or uh, citizens' traffic reduction. We have reduced traffic by 77% in the center of Pontevedra. We have reduced traffic, sorry, by 90%, 77%, just outside of the center, and by about 50% in suburban areas. How many cars are necessary? for a city to keep on functioning. In 1999, we had 80,000 cars driving through our town center. In 2015, only 7,000. The city keeps on working. Local businesses are still flourishing. And as a matter of fact, 
it isn't now much faster to drive around town. It makes sense because thanks to all the roundabouts and speed bumps we've created, we've discouraged car use, which means when you do drive, you're free to do so without getting stuck in traffic jams. Since 2011, there have been zero deaths due to car accidents. There haven't been uh, deaths due to car crashes within the city limits and that in and of itself makes it worth it reduction in emissions 77 percent or 77 uh, 67 percent reduction in co2 emissions we're striving to comply with the parameters recommended by the who logroño was saying this earlier if i'm not mistaken apart from air quality it's important to take heed of other parameters as well as well noise pollution for example the po2 effect is precisely this creating um, closed cities uh, safe spaces within cities in order to contribute to the struggle against climate change basic demographic increase our population has increased by 33 percent and we're the youngest city in galicia and um, in a context of an aging population, let me tell you, we are particularly proud of this um, achievement. But yet another great result came thanks to um, our collective self-confidence. Uh, let me elaborate on that. In 2015, we were already talking about clean cities, public space, and people thought we were weird really but after a bit we started receiving uh, widespread international acknowledged acknowledgement and never would we have thought uh, that we'd ever receive so much appreciation because we're a very very tiny portion of uh, the kingdom of, of the kingdom of spain and um we're very proud to have been uh, recognized as an innovative space we've been in touch with uh, uh, beijing uh, mexican cities we're now in uh, madrid via the lid uh, speaking about pontevedra and we're so proud but even more important the pontevedra model was possible because we all collaborated in creating it our citizens believed in us they have believed in us since 1999 i am sorry if perhaps i'm coming across as uh, overly uh, prideful but uh, we do have achieved a lot and when it comes to city promotion I'm in charge of uh, promotion within uh, our city, and that's closely related to all the changes that have been rung. Let me give you uh, an example. A few years back, The Guardian published an article about Pontevedra, and this gave us a big push in terms of international acknowledgement we wouldn't have had the budget to pay for our um, international positioning campaign without it then the times also wrote an article about us along with other prestigious institution and the truth is we were able to truly bring some important changes in the city after that for us it depends on the clear ideological principles which we have we shouldn't be afraid of words or of actions and we need to follow up all the words with actions and the Valladolid representative said it's the time now to take advantage of all the work that's taking place in a network so that we have clear approaches it's up to us to con to continue to prioritize the right measures and as our mayor always says um, this is working for us, so we need to develop um, what has been achieved already. Uh, it would be good for me to leave uh, these pictures of before and after. 
but the best thing is to see it live and uh, you will think that I'm doing promotion of the city here of course but um, the best thing is truly to come along and, and view it for yourself and we'd be delighted to welcome you to our city. If you If you hear any car horns going off, they won't be Pontevedra cars, they'll be Vigo cars. It's a joke. But uh, uh, I think I'm coming to the end of my time. So i just say that it's been a pleasure to be speaking. And uh, thank you very much for being able to speak to you today. Thank you, Annabel. We've now got the presentation by Cesar Gallardo, who's the Head of Service of the Office for Ecological Transition of Seville City Council. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't know if I'm being heard correctly. Just move a bit further back from the mic, maybe. Better. Do you have a presentation? Yep. Okay. After listening to the presentations of our colleagues, I thought that um, we've got problems in common and um, some of the ideas are common as well. I won't talk about points that have already been touched upon. I'll try to look at some different areas and give a different point of view as to what an LEZ might be. Well, that was a great presentation there from our colleague from Pontevedra, which has made things more difficult for me to come up to that level, but uh, I, I, I will um, do my best. I'll now try to put up my presentation in slides. Okay, so I want to speak about a project which we're undertaking in the Cartuja area of Seville. We propose we've proposed a zero emissions area for that area that neighborhood. Um, to give a bit of background and to tell you something about the geographical context, as you know, the island of La, of La Cartuja received a real boost from 1992 in Seville. And then it turned, ended up being a, a scientific and technological park. And now it's going to be the uh, scene for this project. The Andalusian regional government is also involved in this project, the technological park itself, and also the company Endesa. I want to talk more about this zero emissions uh, project, but there's another LEZ, which we're calling the, the breathing plan. As you can see here in the, uh, the historic old center of Seville and the Triana area of Seville on the map there. There's a clear strategy here up to 2030 vis a vis what we want to see Seville become. And 
along with the sustainable mobility urban plan, we want to have planning and a strategy which will move us towards a city which is able to overcome the challenges that Pontevedra has, yes, but also in terms of the ambition to be a city for people, a climatically respon a, a, a city which is responsible in climate terms. In this sense, the uh, LEZ in the historic centre of the city has achieved um, important goals. But there was a change in the local government so that the advantages didn't uh, run for as long as it was hoped. But this type of traffic exclusion area is, is what we were looking at and are looking at for the old part of the city centre. Obviously, uh, where things have perhaps not begun in exactly the right way, we need to look towards turning things around and, and ensuring that the right result is achieved at the end of the day. We involve all our stakeholders and uh, all citizens in, and take into account all the different activities, of course. Whether we refer to LEZs or whether we refer to zones in a different in different terms, we're talking about the same set of problems. So, in terms of these two LEZs, there's a difference in size. So we're talking about being less or more ambitious depending on the different uh, challenges to hand. So in the zero emissions zone or the low emission zone that we uh, are looking to implement in Cartuja is very ambitious because we're looking to exclude ICE vehicles and make the island not a zero emissions zone and to also be consumption neutral in terms of its functioning overall. We've got 536 companies there who employ over uh, 23,700 workers, three university premises, and uh, so we have over 10,000 university students um, who attend classes there on a daily basis. This is um, obviously of great note. There are perhaps other educational centres which need to be taken into account as well, but here we're just referring to the university students. In terms of our diagnostic plan for Cartuja. We looked at um, the urban mobility plan, of course. And we consulted uh, the uh, business owners um, based in the area. It was, uh, the private private vehicles were seen to be very much the, the the means of transport which transport which we use as we can see here 55 percent so this starting point 
if we take into account where we want to be, we'll need too drastic a challenge in terms of applying the mobility plan for Cartuja. So if we look at Cartuja uh, related to the other LEZs, well, we're looking at restricting access for um, fossil fuel um, combustion vehicles. And elimination, elimination of um, parking on the roads. So ruling out both private vehicles and parking uh, per se. So of course, where parking does exist, as we saw with the case in Pontevedra, there are vehicles, of course. So, um, and uh, this means that it's more difficult to move towards the energy transition goals. The third element is to pedestrianize and re-green our, um, our streets and the streets that are in the middle of the island in particular. And the fourth point is to uh, reach recovery of the boulevards which are there via um, via reurbanization in a bioclimatic way which um, will involve uh, ensuring zero emissions but also to also take into account uh, elements of climate change that are affecting everyone in general in the, in the world, obviously, such as the heat waves and uh, looking at other key elements as well. Implementations of um, a thousand parking stations for which safe parking stations for bikes in this modal shift that we're looking to uh, apply here. We've got 200 kilometers of, of bike lanes in Seville. Uh, and promoting the pri private bikes as being the main means of transport is very important for us. There's also a development of uh, an intermodal mobility plan. Sending out a clear message that please don't come to this zone uh, with private vehicles. And thereby, of course, you need to offer alternative means of transport. So there need to be clear plans of uh, transportation to get people to and from work. And take on board uh, the roles and viewpoints of all the, all the different stakeholders. It's, we're not just talking about the responsibility of local government here. We need to look at responsibility for all of the stakeholders involved. So essential travel, such as uh, um, commuting to and from work, needs to be um, viewed in a holistic manner and we need to ensure that we take into consideration the role of everyone, the companies and uh, people themselves. Management of, um, of parking spaces and uh, the infrastructure for, um, 
for battery charging for all the uh, the elect electric vehicles ensure that uh, people understand that it, it'll be hard or virtually impossible to park there and send out there by a clear message that uh, they shouldn't come with private cars. We have to also look at uh, certain of the comments and, and uh, um, ideas that came about in terms of the role of metropolitan areas and their impact on on big cities. So, uh, in our case, for example, a large percentage of decisions that we are bound to apply have come from uh, the uh, the metropolitan area institution. So. Things are really bound up um, in the different competence levels. And there's also the management of uh, the share out of the last mile in terms of uh, the achievement of what we're um, hoping for. Obviously, we're looking to reduce emissions and to improve air, air quality, that's clear. It's a light motive, but we also want to um, reorder many of the different factors that are involved in this in the city. Many of the different uh, stakeholders, and as in other big cities, we have to involve everyone in in Seville and ensure that everyone is singing from the same him sheet. And lastly, then point 10, um, we want to look at autonomous um, driving and mobility within the urban area, which will, which do fit in with the objectives that we're looking for. So the three overarching elements that I referred to in the at the outset and then these more detailed points um, which I've listed here in uh, as 10 and overall of course this ensuring that we improve well-being for everyone who lives here and also uh, we improve the quality of public space for use by anybody And in terms of uh, pedestrians, we're not talking about uh, uh, changes to make things make people worse off, to uh, necessarily change from combustion-based vehicles to electric ones, and that's it. We're looking at uh, the the issues in a full way, looking at this invasion of public space and how we can improve things in that sense. We don't want to necessarily achieve uh, this point on the left. Um, we should have maintained this uh, this technological park like this, and this didn't happen, unfortunately. But uh, it, it does seem amazing that we're looking back to applying some of the best results from 92 now in 2021, but we have to look at things that were done well um, in the past as well. And, um, we have to look at uh, certain of the large uh, avenues and we have to try to make sure that the project along the lines that we're developing it is uh, implemented in exactly the right way and that we work towards uh, the right results for our climate change um, measures which will ensure that we are uh, working in, uh, to combat climate change in the best way possible and that we recover public spaces for people. 
verdaderamente eh, no deben ser no deben ser para para el coche. And this is truly something that we need to do for our citizens. There are a number of examples I could give in this regard. But anyway, I was talking about intermodality earlier within uh, mobility, which has its advantages, clearly. Currently, we have been working towards putting a ban on combustion engine vehicles within a certain area of the city. We already have two LEZs. Um, apart from that, and um, we've launched a pilot initiative that's led to the creation of three um, skate rental stations, uh, stations where you can go and rent out your skates to move around the city. We also have buses, of course. In Katuja, we have two circle lines. We want to create a third bus route that goes through the whole city. And that surely will greatly help us reduce traffic. We also have an uh, underground, the metro. This is the intermodality I was talking about earlier. We also have an overground um, service that connects the city to Cartuja. Now, I talked about the uh, underground line earlier. Unfortunately, we currently only have exactly one line. But it's something we will look at expanding in the future. We also have speed bumps, similar to those my colleague from Pontevedra um, talks about earlier. We have speed bumps on the island of Cartuja, and uh, they are an interesting solution when intermodality is not an option. This is one of the um, skates I was talking about. We have this beautiful platform that can be used to rent them out at a very low cost. We also have a um, pilot project to provide uh, Cartuja employees with free um, scooters, like the one you saw in the picture. These are the 10 um, companies that have been taking part in this pilot project. And once again, their employees can opt to use this uh, alternative means of transport to go into work. Regarding corporate mobility plans, that's also a shared responsibility. Within uh, the park, companies employ thousands of people who, of course, have a number of obligations uh, to face. And that's why we thought it would be interesting to provide them with alternate transport solutions. Our goals here are, number one, to reduce travel 
as a general rule and reduce its cost uh, as well. Our alternatives are cheaper than private vehicles. If they weren't, it would be difficult to propose them as a viable alternative. Another thing we want to do is reduce travel time between Seville downtown, so to speak, and the Cartuja island. We also want to reduce our carb carbon footprint. Um, that's also an important responsibility that we have, a responsibility that uh, all the workers of La Cartuja have. And uh, in order to do that, we want to encourage sustainable mobility solutions. Finally, all in all, if we want to achieve these goals, we need to enable companies to offer viable solutions to their employees. And that's why we launched this pilot project. Companies, I have to say, have helped us in coming up with our uh, alternate mobility programs. And uh, we have been able, I think, to come up with viable alternatives to private transport. In order to do that, we had to familiarize ourselves with the concerns of their employees, how long it takes them to get into work, how they get into work, what means of transport they use. We did just that. We've launched this pilot project and we think uh, it could uh, give good results. Of course, in this plan, plan, like we would have to do in any other plans, we need to do some follow-up work as well. Now I'm going to speed up a bit because I don't have a lot of time left. Regarding parking, in cities on a daily basis, Whenever a new measure is adopted, well, it takes some time for it to really um, be accepted by the population to sink in. Even if the measure you, um, as an administrator, proposed is more efficient um than existing solutions in the case of parking spaces we are aware that we need to offer our citizens some sort of viable alternative in la cartuja there are currently 15600 um parking spots altogether That's not ideal, because with all those parking spaces, we encourage employees to use their private vehicles. Uh, so the blue arrow on the screen is pointing at the two parking areas within um, the Cartuja island and to a central square in the city where a public transport is available from. That could be a solution, but it's something we have to keep on working on. Can you wrap up, please? Yes, of course. To conclude, I would like to encourage you to familiarize yourselves with the E-City Seville project. The goals that have been set for 2050 have been a guiding light for us, and I think uh, this can be an interesting project for you all to look at. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Caesar. There will now be a Q&A uh, session. A few people have requested uh, the floor, both online and uh, in the room. Yes, we have a question from Ariadna, so the Logroño representative. They ask if you've worked with um, alongside families, uh, parents, children, and also if you worked on uh, the project of super blocks. Uh, I also have another question myself for the table. I seem to understand that traffic has reduced by 30% in Valladolid with the last few measures that were adopted. The same goes for Pontevedra, although possibly to a higher extent, I seem to remember 80% in fact. I also wanted to ask you if in Logroño and Seville you already have data regarding traffic reduction in your cities over the past few years and regarding Seville. I have a more specific question. Uh, an extensive network of bike lanes has been uh, uh, set up in Seville quite a few years ago. I wanted to ask you if that's had an impact on traffic reduction. Okay, so to answer your questions, yes, we did work alongside families in uh, our schools. As a matter of fact, uh, the requests we received uh, came from um, uh, the families directly. With the pandemic, we took the opportunity to expand a number of pavements across the city. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, families demonstrated uh, they launched a demonstration to call for these changes within the city. Um, from the administration as well, we talked to them about bus routes. Um, we talked to families precisely, that's fundamental. Um, regarding your second question, super blocks, like you called them. We started working towards that in the first part, during the first part of the pandemic. We started out with a simple proposal, because at first we sort of wanted to test the waters and see how it was going to be received by the population. And we're still in that phase, actually. Um, in other cases, in, we've also had an opportunity uh, to act uh, more extensively. Uh, after all, whenever citizens participate in these processes, it's normal um, for these initiatives to take some time before being taken to full fruition. Finally, about data, um, I don't think we have any uh, conclusive data right now because uh, this is still a work in progress situation. Uh, the pandemic led to a significant reduction in traffic, of course, which was great, but it was a bit of an unusual situation. Maria, yes, it'll be very quick in January this year. 2021, thanks to the measures we adopted, it has been estimated that 9,000 cars now enter our city from the west entrance. That's half as many as we used to have. Regarding pollution, I talked in my presentation about the effects of the pandemic and lockdowns, but in August 2021, compared uh, to 2019 levels, there has been a significant improvement. Pontevedra, do you have any figures for us? 
The reduction in uh, traffic was 97% in the town center after a month since uh, we took office, 87% in the immediate vicinity of the town center and 57% globally within our town hall. All of these data are available on our web page. Um, clicking on the PO2 observatory, observatory tab. The PO2 observatory is a department we created to monitor the environmental situation within our city. So, Seville, can you answer the question about bike lanes in Seville? Right, so about traffic reduction, I don't have any uh, figures now, especially relating to bicycle use. Um, hopefully I'll be able to give you these figures later on, but I can tell you that uh, bike use had uh, went through phases. We had a peak in 2011 when we first created uh, the LEZ. At that point there was a boom in bicycle use. Uh, we actually uh, went up a few position in the world ranking. Then in 2019, there was another peak after um, a slight decrease in bike use in the years following 2011. We're getting close to 2011 levels. Uh, we were at least as of 2019. Right now, we don't have any figures because the pandemic has had a huge impact on mobility. In 2011, we had about 72,000 uh, active bike users, and uh, before the pandemic, we had about 70,000. Thank you, Caesar. Any more requests for the floor? Garcia Vicente. Yes. Hello, I'm from Madrid. In this panel, you talked about your projects. They're all beautiful. Congrats. But I also want to say that there are a number of civil servants, public servants that end up becoming public enemies. In Madrid, for example, people have actively worked against all the measures that had been proposed in terms of sustainable mobility in the past few years. And we did really take a hit there. 200,000 euros were spent towards lifting the LEZ from central Madrid after we'd done so much to comply with the EU regulations and climate change goals. That's truly disgraceful. But I also have a question for you. I think uh, everything uh, we do should uh, transcend the, the individual needs of our cities. What's at stake here is uh, the very survival of humanity, our health. It's something we can achieve if we work together. I wanted to thank the organizers of this event for everything they did. That's all from me. Thank you. Does anyone want to answer? Well, I'm in agreement with what's already been said, Pilar, in terms of the model that we're talking about pushing things forward very fast because obviously people have been talking about climate change since the 1960s and uh, there's been a fear in terms of um, acting because um, if people thought, that, well, if I get rid of cars, I'm going to lose votes uh, in terms of we're thinking of polit politicians. Um, so. It's taken a long time, but it's true that uh, it's very unfortunate that people are taking, trying to get credit for their parties out of certain of the actions. 
all, all parties uh, say that they're in agreement of uh, with uh, the main thrust of, of what we've been talking about but when it comes down to it um, and people think that they can get hold of a few more votes by saying one thing or another or pandering to one group or another uh, by criticizing levels of participation or, or making up other uh, issues as opposed to everyone um, working in the same direction and trying to get across the message in because everyone is in broad agreement when we were talking about uh, um, public ownership of um, of water and how this is management and uh, certain of the elements um, as well in in Pontevedra in 2015 I think there were certain uh, uh, people if we look at the different um, municipal governments uh, for example uh, in Madrid Mas Madrid for example uh, Ines Sabanés uh, when she, and uh, Madrid Madrid Central and now things are just being reversed uh, now so these are really things which are against common sense and which are against health um, in terms of the climate change law in Spain, well, it really does uh, create a legal legal provision for the um, for the uh, for the le leses, and um, you, this is a good thing. But it would be additionally good if um, if also local laws would uh, ring fence certain of the progress which has been made in uh, the sense in which we're all talking here today. Uh, obviously, the different realities are, are there for everyone to see if we look at different cities, but um, there are certain points in common as, as we've all been saying today. And uh, we do need to, to go along hand in hand with the different social organizations, even though there will be criticism, um, because we need to ensure that everyone is um, moving along in the same direction and that we're really operating in terms of common sense. Uh, uh, also, er everyone else here is a is a is a is a politician, and I'm and I'm a civil servant. This is what Thesa said to me. Do you want to say anything in there? Well. when there has been there have been attacks to call them something in terms of uh, private vehicles there has been a lot of uh, noise uh, created and um, you have to be aware of this but sometimes you have to work hard and take a long time to be able to apply certain positive measures and get the message across in the right way and uh, also there needs to, to be time sometimes for people to be able to perceive the benefits of applying certain of the uh, measures which we've been talking about in these terms then in the past where things were perhaps discussed uh, a lot more heatedly in in Seville they they they've now become areas in where there is broad general agreement and that's what um, happens sometimes when a certain amount of time goes by you can uh, people can see clearly the benefits of measures applied and that means also that in many cases there has been uh, there have been different municipal laws that have been put in place to uh, back up the measures your interpreter speaking we can't hear the speaker hello Thank you very much for all the talks. It's all, they've all been very, very interesting. And um, 
Uh, I've learned a lot from everything I've been listening to. I have a number of comments and also a question which isn't related to this issue, but then it does. I'll explain myself. Can you just say who you are, please? Joaquin Robledo, and I'm uh, a Valladolid citizen. I'm uh, been involved in certain groups in, in this type of area in my city. I've been, uh, been a bike rider only for 35 years, and I haven't got a, a, a driving license. One of the photos that they were vaunting and talking positively about from uh, Pontevedra would actually uh, lead to a fine in, 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 in Valladolid. Um, so um, we, there are serious differences when we look at the different measures that have been applied. I've been surprised. There's a big river in each of the plans, and that is important in the city and also in terms of the local governments involved. You may think it's anecdotal, but uh, the fact that there's a river does influence things and um, has a real uh, impact when we're looking at town planning. Uh, if you uh, look at other cities which don't have that situation or the big river and they just expand uh, madly as it were. So I've been living in La Victoria neighborhood of Valladolid for 30 years and um, Speaking of another one, which is called Huerta del Rey neighborhood as well. If we're looking at pleasanter and more livable cities, in Huerta del Rey we got a victory in a more spontaneous, spontaneous fashion. But it depends who you speak to to, to, to get a a verdict on the situation. We need anthropological analyses of these situations. We've talked about schools, we've talked about universities, hospitals, but we haven't talked about parks. Or or other, or other meeting places like bars or, or social centers. So these are key as well when we're looking at a holistic approach to the issues we've been um, dealing with. We have to look at things in terms of community life. And when we look at this type of analysis, Obviously, um, there are so many issues which may be positive, but in Huerta del Rey, where things were implemented in a, in a very designed way, but it's a kind of a dead neighborhood, as it were. La Victoria has a lot more life, and it's um, right next to it. It's just a lot more lively and there's a lot more going on. And all the guys and people from Huerta Rey come, come to Victoria to, to have a drink, etc. I agree with uh, Joaquin's reflection. I, I'm from Huerta del Rey. I live in Huerta del Rey myself and I, and I don't have a driving license. But yes, you're right. Um, in Valladolid, um, the railway was seen as a kind of... Um, wound. Uh, the river is a space that means that Valladolid is a very special place um, and there are bike lanes which are exclusive in certain of the areas which are um, particular and um, people even had plans to 
use uh, certain river paths for bikes instead of having bike lanes. So um, we have to be aware, you know, there may be other uses that are not just bike riding alongside the river. Uh, in terms of the urban structure and also the type of people who live in the different neighborhoods, you have to take that into account as well. Uh, I agree with your analysis there. There's a lot more uh, about Huerta Rey and La Victoria. If you look at uh, the different businesses, like uh, different bars, etc., it's a more complex debate. If we look at the service sector and how catering and restaurants um, is very important for cities like Valladolid. For me, that's not positive on a personal level, but um, it's a fact. Also, the prices of uh, flats, for example, are more expensive in a, in a neighborhood like Huerta del Rey. That means pe more people will also be looking to live in La Victoria because it's cheaper. So there's a lot more people who are migrants living there. Um, you have to be aware that there's uh, richer living places which maybe exclude people um, of who have come as newcomers to the city because of the prices in places like Huerta del Rey. Um, it's complex. And I, yes, I do go to La Victoria for, for a glass of wine. So let's, let's uh, end our round table today. Thank all the speakers uh, for their great explanations and generosity. I think we'll now move on to our lunch. Thank you to everyone. Thank you.